Well, good afternoon, lady. Where is she? And 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 Je sorry. Yes, I know. And uh, she's not just our token female rep. She's a very active member, and we we'll welcome her. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, welcome to this very special part of Sydney. On behalf of the trustees, it's the Premier and the Leader of the Opposition and the management of the memorial here, we consider this a very great privilege to be able to work from this special place. And if you haven't seen it already, then I would encourage you to come, particularly in time for the ceremony at 11 o'clock each day, every day except Christmas Day, I think, and Good Friday. Uh, it is a, a, a wonderful spot and it's full of information. Um, first of all, if we do, you know where the restrooms are. In the event of a fire, the, the exit is through the corridor out to Liverpool Street. Um, we warmly welcome you all here today, and <clears throat> I'd like to pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and future from the Gadigal clan in the Aora Nation, which is contained within the Greater Sydney Basin. Um, we acknowledge their, their contribution now. Uh, I always thought that the welcome to country was a little bit tokenistic until recently. The more I've studied it, the greater impact it's ha having on me. This is NIDOC week, or we just had it recently, and I was privileged to be able to attend the ceremony held here in commemoration of our Indigenous ex-servicemen. It was very impressive with the didgeridoos accompanying the naval band and some wonderful speeches. I commend that sort of thing to you. Other requests today? Please uh, check out our Library of National Significance. Uh, it, it has got a lot of material there. And having moved from our previous place in location in Pitt Street in the Defence Centre, it's now generally accessible. Uh, we're open, try to keep open between hours of 10 and 4, uh, Monday to Friday, and by arrangement at any special time. Can you also please, even though there's no cost for today's ceremony, can you please actually log your attendance in with Greg over there at the desk? It is a requirement for us to do that. I am. <coughs> uh, my name's Michael Flynn, by the way. Uh, I'm standing in for our president, Michael Howe. Michael is at home, further enhancing his uh, immunity status by testing COVID. For, actually, in addition to being immunised and boosted, if you get the, the condition, and I've had it, it does not prevent you getting it, uh, but it does ameliorate the symptoms if you've been fully vaccinated. Michael sends his apologies. And I'd now like to call on Lieutenant Colonel Ron Lyons to in, uh, outline the role of our speaker today. Uh, I have read his bio. I was exhausted at the end of it. And you'll give an abbreviated version of it. Thank you, Ron. Thanks, Michael. <coughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fifth in our lecture series for 2022. Our overall theme for activities this year is Improving Australia's Regional Security and the title of today's lecture is The Australian Industry and Defence Network and its role in improving Australia's regional security. It will be presented by Mr Brent Clark who is the Chief Executive Officer of AIDN and Brent joined the Royal Australian Navy in 1989 and served till 1999 in a range of command, training, staff and development roles in the submarine force. After leaving the Navy, he occupied a number of business development and strategic procurement roles with organisations such as Saab Systems, Talis, BAE Systems and the Naval Group. He took up his present position as CEO of the Australian Industry and Defence Network in 2020. AIDN represents some 1,100 Australian companies in defence industry advocacy to government and it's an important agent in the defence procurement process. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome our speaker, Mr Frank Clark. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks, uh, Ron, for that uh, introduction. Um, 
my CV is not really that impressive, but it uh, just means I've changed jobs a lot. Um, I really would also like to pass on my acknowledgement to the Gadigai people here in uh, the Sydney Basin. Um, I agree completely with your sentiment about the welcome to country. I was uh, used to be a bit cynical about it. In fact, it started as a um, bit of trivial pursuit here. It started as an event. Nick Kelty, as the then Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police, was the first person to do a welcome to country. And he did that after doing a, a survey amongst his serving police officers, and they felt that that would help bring um, Indigenous and, and, and non-Indigenous officers together. So there's a bit of history there for you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me uh, here today. I'd just like to um, acknowledge that we have a new government, an incoming government. I should mention Richard Miles, who's the De uh, Defence Minister and Deputy Prime Minister. Pat Conroy, who is the uh, new Minister for Defence Industry. I should also like to acknowledge Matt Keogh, who is the Minister for Veteran Affairs and Defence Personnel. And Matt will, um, I've, I've spent a couple of years working very closely with Matt, and I'm sure that our, vet, our vets and our defence personnel will benefit from his, um, his experience in that area. And then Matt uh, Thistlewaite, who's the Assistant Minister for Defence and Vet Affairs and Defence Personnel. Strain industry capability, industry perspectives, improving our regional uh, security. These are all very big topics, I guess. I guess I would start very quickly with the rest of the world. The United States, the United Kingdom, the EU, Sweden, South Korea, Israel, Turkey, a variety of countries around the world all have their own indigenous defence strategic policy in place. These policies are all exempt from free trade agreements, so quite often you may hear Department of Finance uh, say that um, we're unable to do certain things because of free trade agreements. Defence is, is, is actually set aside from any of those free trade agreements and is set aside for national strategic reasons. The Indian government, as recently as 18 months ago, set up a Made in India program and they actually had, went to the effort of actually having a schedule. So over the next three to four years, the Indian government will be slowly winding back any outside industrial involvement and they'll be increasing the levels of capability of their own indigenous uh, companies. And there's a reason why we do these sorts of things. So why is AIC important? Self-reliance, sovereignty, supply chain resilience, research and development, the mobilisation of the industrial base, the economic benefits, i.e. the return on investment for the Australian taxpayer. Now, we see a lot of commentators downplaying the role of Australian industry in most defence projects. Now, it will not surprise any of you. Um, as, as was alluded to, my primary role is to look after Australian industry. Our definition of Australian industry is Australian-owned companies or Australian-controlled companies. That's the same definition that the Americans use, OK? So, so we are working with government because currently the definition for an Australian company is anybody with an ABN. Now, I can go on to the ATO website now and create an ABM for myself within about five minutes, OK? So our argument is that is not a satisfactory definition, so we, we are urging government to adopt the American model uh, for obvious reasons. Um, clearly, Australian ownership is Australian ownership, but, but sovereign control in the Australian environment. And what does sovereign control mean? If I look at the example of BA Systems, you now we all uh, presumably know about BA Systems in Australia, it's a 100% UK owned company, but it also has a very large presence in the United States. In fact, it's the third largest defence contractor in the United States. The US government, the US Department of State, imposed certain conditions on BA Systems because BA Systems effectively merged a whole bunch of American com companies together under one banner. So all control of BA Systems Inc. is vested in the BA Systems US board. The only elements that are exposed, for want of a better description, to the UK is the profit and loss. Okay? So the United States government can contract directly with BA Systems Inc. without any technology transfer leaking across boundaries. So when I talk about Australian control, that's what I mean by Australian control. If I looked at a company like Saab Systems here in Australia, so all the intellectual property, all the technical know-how, all, all the ability to actually understand the product that Saab is doing in Australia, combat management systems on the NZ class frigates, just to name one example, all that information, all that ability resides here in Australia, 
and the Board of Saab Australia can make business decisions about that combat management system. It can take an approach from the Australian government, let's pick a topic, let's call it, say, hypersonic missiles. The Australian government could contract Saab here in Australia to make an amendment to the combat management system for the inclusion of hypersonic missiles. That information does not go back to Sweden. So that, we would say, is vested sovereign control. And it's really important to try and understand the differential between these sorts of things. We've all seen, unfortunately, and, and, and Mike spoke about your president having COVID and uh, the numbers are becoming quite alarming. I, I think yesterday Australia had the third highest per capita rate of infections of COVID in the world. Um, and our death rate is actually exceeding what we had two years ago under, under lockdown. So it's, it's not something that's going to go away quickly. It's infected and impacted all supply chains uh, quite dramatically. I'll give you a working example. Unfortunately, I reversed my car a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> uh, it's my neighbour's car. Um, that's another story. Um, <clears throat> exchange details, we obviously know where we are. Um, I got distracted, it is what it is. Um, I've been told that a little bracket that might, very little damage, a little bracket that's got to come from Germany will take four months to come because of supply chain issues. And it's a bracket that could be manufactured in Australia. So from our perspective, we need to be very careful. We need to understand the fragility of the supply chains that we're operating in. The world has changed. Um, we have all seen what's happening in the Ukraine. We have no idea when that conflict's going to be over. Um, in fact, we have no idea at all what uh, Vladimir Putin is actually thinking and in terms of how he intends to escalate that, if he intends to escalate that. That's impacted directly the supply chains of the world. You're all seeing that today. The cost of living has risen to 7%. And next week, when the Reserve Bank publishes its figures, it could be almost 10%. Right? So th these are huge cost increases to us. China. Now, from an aid perspective, I'm quite happy to talk about China. Uh, a lot of people don't. Um, China is effectively going through a fairly large strategic ramp up in our region. China is looking to our region to expand into. We cannot kid ourselves that's what they are trying to do. That's fine. That's what they're going to do. Australia, the United States, other like-minded allies need to be able to counter that. China is not going to go away. Right? We, we, we kid ourselves if we think they're just going to stop. Currently, they're our largest trading partner, both from an export and from an import perspective. The Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party, <coughs> could switch Australia off fairly quickly for a period of time by denying exports to enter this country. The vast majority of the things that we are importing from China are things that could be done in Australia. For example, you might remember the famous toilet paper run of two years ago, or you might think about the PP, PPI that you're wearing on your face. All those masks were being produced by China, <clears throat> we had a, and the toilet paper was coming out of China. We had a major shortage because the Chinese government stopped supply. Okay? It was as simple as that. So people panicked, people went and bought toilet paper for whatever reason, and most of us will never understand why, but people rushed out and bought toilet paper. There was not the ability to backfill that. We did not have the toilet paper in this country to do that. Now, the, fed, the previous government, through some incentives, got some, uh, the ability to create toilet paper rather quickly. Same with the masks that you wear. All those masks were coming from China. They were coming from China because they were one cent a mask. Right? They can be made here in Australia, but we chose not to do that. <clears throat> the Australian government then gave a series of contracts to Australian companies to produce those masks. Those masks were being produced at five cents a mask. Okay, That's, that was the cost. Five times as much, yeah, okay, but it's five cents versus one cent. How many in this room would realise that post all those contracts being given by the Australian government to those Australian companies, they've all ceased? And we are now back purchasing face masks from China because they're only one cent a mask. So, I use these kind of real-world examples of the need and the necessity for an Australian industry and the fact that an Australian industry exists here. 
What we really need to be looking at is how we develop, nurture and increase the capability of Australian industry. Oh, sorry, I'll just talk very quickly about this slide. <clears throat> the reason why I put this slide up, sorry, I do wander from time to time. Um, these are legislative acts in countries around the world that you'll see now. So the, you know, I, we, we refer to the top one, the United States Production Act of 1950, as the Jones Act. The American Department of Defence has a legislative requirement to purchase things from American companies. That's it. That's how it works. American companies can bring in and import equipment from uh, overseas companies under special circumstances. What they tend to do is buy the IP or buy the rights and then manufacture in the United States. If you look at that list, each and every one of those acts is set in place so that that country can safeguard its local domestic um, industry base, particularly in defence. And I'm going to keep obviously talking about defence, not because it's this, this uh, audience, but in terms of a production facility and a manufacturing base and an industrial capability, the most important thing that a country needs is to have a sovereign industrial capability. So some facts from a defence perspective. <clears throat> As you can see there, we rank 11th in the world in terms of um, imports. Um, the, our defence budget is one of the largest defence budgets. We are up going through a major upgrade of defence equipment. <clears throat> the previous Prime Minister threw around numbers like 270 billion, like it was a cheeseburger from McDonald's. Uh, the simple reality is it's a huge amount of money. But the defence enterprise costs this country $554 billion over the next 10 years. So that's $55 billion per year for all expenditure on defence. The latest ANZ bank data research on expenditure in Australia out of that budget <clears throat> was no more than 48% of that money is spent in Australia. Of that 48% that's spent in Australia, at least 24%, i.e. half, is spent with foreign-owned overseas prime contractors. So you can start to do the maths in your own head. <clears throat> so basically about a quarter of $550 billion, and it's everyone sitting in this room, it's your money, we need to remember that. So a quarter of that money is being spent with Australian industry. Now our argument is that's simply not good enough. Um, there are innumerable economic studies that show that for every dollar, <clears throat> whether it's a defence spend or a non-defence spend, every dollar that's spent in your local country or your local market or here in Sydney returns a dollar at worst. Some of the studies find that it's two dollars. So every dollar I spend means I get a two dollar return. Okay? So if I spend ten billion dollars in Australia, <clears throat> if I accept the middle ground, that's a fifteen billion dollar return to our economy. Now our argument is that's the same kind of metric for what's happening in other countries. So we, we believe that the Australian government needs to be mobilising the Australian industrial base and the Australian economy <clears throat> as opposed to the economies and the industrial bases of overseas entities. If I look very quickly, and I, I, I haven't got many slides, I, I'm probably like everybody in the room, I'm not much on a PowerPoint sort of person. What, is this, what does this slide tell us? Um, so obviously from an aiding perspective, we're particularly concerned about Australian industry and we're particularly concerned about the small to medium enterprises. Those small to medium enterprises employ the majority of people in this country. So our membership base is somewhere, they employ roughly about 60,000 full-time employees. What this graph basically tells you is that the expenditure in Australia on the SME community is staying relatively constant, but there are more SME, Australian SMEs trying to get into that. But the alarming thing is you are seeing an increase of overseas countries, i.e. the EU, the United States, the United Kingdom, taking funds from Australian industry. So effectively, Australian companies, more of them, all trying to drink from the same bucket, and we're now finding that they now have to compete with a variety of overseas companies. <clears throat> Why do we care? We care for a whole bunch of reasons. 
And I'm going to keep coming back to a common theme. It's about a sovereign industrial capability. What do you want your country to be able to do? Do we wish to be able to do construction, research and development? Do we wish to manufacture in this country? Do we wish to be able to put our own systems into these ships? Do we wish to be able to maintain and repair and look after these ships, sh sh uh, uh, tanks, aircraft, etc.? We need to care about this. We need to care about the creation of a sovereign industrial capability because if we don't do that, then we find ourselves beholden to foreign powers. Now, let me say straight, on the, straight off the bat, um, <clears throat> I do not think that the United States and the United Kingdom um, would do, intentionally do the wrong thing by Australia. They are terrific allies to this country. However, the simple reality is they have their own industrial needs. Their military has its own, its own industrial requirements. If we look at AUKUS at the moment, so we, I, I, I used to make the joke at the start that having been the XCO at Naval Group, it was all fine when I was there, and uh, the person that took over ruined it all. But let's, let's just move on from there. Um, so what, what, what we have happening um, with AUKUS, and I, for one, as an ex-submarine officer, believe that a nuclear submarine is absolutely the way to go. I think it's, it's a great capability. But we have an agreement between Australia, the UK and the US that we're going to put into place to construct a nuclear submarine in this country. There are whole elements of that submarine that should be and could be constructed here in Australia. I am not, nor is Aiden, advocating for the construction of a nuclear power plant here in Australia. Could, it, could Australia do that? Potentially. Um, does Australia need to do it? Not really. Um, there's, no, there's no benefit to Australia to, to making that uh, power plant. Can Australia build a nuclear submarine? Yes. A nuclear submarine is just like a normal submarine, except it's got a nuclear reactor. So, so the rest of the submarine is just a normal submarine. So in terms of the pressure hull, in terms of the hydraulic system, in terms of the electrical system, in terms of every system on board that submarine, that can be done in Australia by Australian companies. ASC today is doing 80% of that work with Australian companies on Collins class submarines. The electrical system or the hydraulic system or the freshwater system or the chilled water system, whatever system you want to talk about, is effectively the same system on a conventional submarine as it is on a nuclear submarine. There's just a nuclear power plant. The nuclear power plant creates steam, the steam drives turbines, and the turbines drive the shaft, and that's how you, how you get going. Okay. So our argument there is that we need to be collaborating today with the UK and US companies to facilitate the transfer of technical knowledge, know-how, know-why, intellectual property to Australian companies. If that means that we have to create the Australian company, then so be it. We believe that the government needs to look at how you actually go about doing that. For example, <clears throat> the federal government has a series of strategic industry capabilities in place. Okay? Now, they're not, they're not capabilities that we've voted on. These are recommendations from defence that were taken to government, and government accepted those recommendations, and that's fine. The bit that hasn't been done with those strategic industry capabilities is where do you want to end up? So it's all well and good for me to decide that I want Australia to have an electronic warfare indigenous capability. I, I, can, I can make that grandiose statement, okay? But what we need to do is an assessment of what exists in the Australian environment today, i.e. what can we do today? We then need to work out and accept what, where we want to get to. What do we want to do at the end? Right? So there'll be two extremes on that. And then in the middle will be the roadmap on how we go about doing that. Now that may well be that we say, here is a limited capability in Australia. We know that we have to increase that capability. Okay, there's an investment required. There's, there's intent required. We'll do that. We will then use and work with uh, the overseas prime contractors. We'll work with the BA Systems. We'll work with the Lockheed Martin. We'll work with the Northrop Grumman, et cetera, et cetera. We will work with them, we will pay them to do it, to bring about and upskill and increase the level of Australian capability for our industry. That's how you then create that sovereign capability. Okay. 
I put this slide up, not to be controversial, I put this slide up because this is the current reality. So for those that don't know, that's a Hunter class frigate. So that's the frigate that's being currently built in South Australia. Um, it was based on a Type 26 design from the UK. Um, I'm not going to get into the programmatic issues or anything like that. That's, that's not an aid and remit. What we did is the research of the systems that are going into the Australian warship today. And we felt that the best way of highlighting this would be to put the flags of country of origin of where those systems are coming from. Every one of those flags <coughs> indicates a subsidiary of the flag. Now, I'll give you 10 seconds. You probably don't need that long. Um, but this is an Australian ship. This is an Australian ship that during the tendering bid phase, all the tenders, tenders involved said that they would strive to include as much Australian industry as they possibly could. Now our view is that's a pretty unattractive picture if you're an Australian company. In fact, you'd probably say that's just not good enough. Okay? Now, you will possibly have seen I've made some commentary on this ship in terms of the supply chain. Um, what Defence is saying is that they are working with the contractor. Let me just rewind that a little bit. Aiden is not anti-overseas prime. We work very closely with the prime contractors to, to, to facilitate getting Australian companies into their supply chain to ensure that there is equitable work and Australian companies are able to compete fairly and equitably for work into supply chains, right? And, and, and by far and away, the vast majority of our interactions with those overseas primes is great. Um, we're able, we've been able to achieve a lot of things here. We are not having a go at BA systems with this slide at all. We are not having a go at BA systems with this slide. BA systems had an acquisition strategy that for the first batch, so for shipbuilding, you tend to build in batches. So the first batch, of, they're going to get nine of these frigates. So that batch one is three frigates. So batch two is three frigates. Frigate, frigates. Batch three is three frigates. BA Systems has committed to, for the fourth ship, or the first ship of batch two, to start getting Australian companies into this supply chain. We don't believe that can be done successfully because you are then talking about changing the supply chain of a ship for, for, for frigates into the build. If that happens, then the amount of risk that is now applied to that ship, the slippage in schedule to that ship, the slippage in cost to that ship, is all going to be borne by the Australian taxpayer. Our argument is that the, ne the necessary work that's required to get the Australian companies into the supply chain, to get them qualified to actually supply, to get them prototyping, to get them up, uh, upskilled, to get them their plant machinery equipment um, invigorated, for them to be able to compete for this work needs to be being done today and we need to be including that in the first batch of ships. Okay? And it, the longer I leave it up there, the, it doesn't get any prettier as a picture. Okay, it's just not going to get any prettier. I'm sorry. Um, as you can see, phase array radar that's done by a great Australian company, and uh, it's actually one of the uh, world's leading phase array radars. Uh, Australian steel, uh, we make a big deal in this country about steel. Um, I just probably would like to say the attack class submarine program was going to be 12, uh, four and a half thousand ton submarines. The amount of steel that the submarines were going to require would take uh, BHB Billiton or Blue Scope Steel in Wollongong a day and a half to produce. Australian governments get themselves locked into steel, OK? I used to have a, pitch, a flag there for the, flag, the uh, two flagpoles, the two ensign staffs, um, but I, I felt that that was just being a little bit too facetious. Um, but that's it. That's that's what we've got today. Um, so we're obviously going to we're obviously out there arguing uh, fairly strongly to um, to try and change that situation. 
<coughs> and how do you end up with this? Sorry, when you go. Um, you end up with this because there's no government policy, um, and the government doesn't end up pushing for Australian inclusion. Okay? VA Systems has done nothing wrong at all. VA Systems has turned around and said, this is the schedule you want me to meet, this is the budget you want me to achieve. I have been working with these companies on the Type 26 in the United Kingdom for a decade. I can guarantee that all those suppliers meet my requirements and can meet my schedule and meet my cost. All right? So VA Systems has done nothing wrong. The fault lies, if we're going to use the word fault, with defence to a certain extent, but to government, and this is previous government, allowing this to occur. So our argument is that if you want to have a proper sovereign industrial capability, you actually have to have some sort of le legislative mechanism to enforce it. Defence will do what it's, what it's asked to do. Um, again, we, we, we're great supporters of defence. We never hold defence accountable for these sorts of decisions. Defence is doing what it is tasked to do. Defence is here to provide a service to government. I'm going to bet that the vast majority of people sitting in this room have done some service. Right? So your service was at the behest of the Australian government. Defence itself gave you uniforms, food, equipment, etc., etc., all, all the things that you needed to do your job. That's what defence does, and defence should do that. Defence is not here to be an industrial welfare program. Defence is not here to create a sovereign industrial capability. Defence does not have that ability. It does not have that expertise inside it to do that. It is an unfair constraint. So, so defence will go to the government and say, we need this capability. Let's call it a 100-class frigate. The government will say, fair enough, we'll do a competition. They did a competition. There were three designs. This one won for, for whatever reasons it won. And I've got no, no, no doubt that Defence did a proper analysis and they picked the one that they wanted, no, no doubt at all. Okay? <clears throat> but in that process, government kept saying, oh, we want to create a sovereign industrial capability, we want you to make sure that you give heaps of work to Australian companies, um, oh, by the way, we'll put in a tokenism of a 54% in Australian industry content in there. Australian industry content means nothing. Okay? Um, it's all about capability from our perspective. I was having this discussion with uh, Chris just before. I can go to Officeworks today because Officeworks is 100% owned Australian company, okay? I can buy $10 million worth of reflex photocopying paper because reflex photocopying paper is produced in Australia. I have fulfilled Australian industry content now, I hazard a guess, I could be wrong. I'm sure if I'm the CEO of Officeworks, I wouldn't want to hear this. But that does nothing for our sovereign capability and that does nothing for increasing the skill base of Australia. But it's Australian content, right? But if you look at that little flag up there that says phase array radar, that is 20 years worth of research and development, millions of dollars that have been pumped into that company to come up with a local version of a phased array radar which is world leading technology. Now that, lady and gentlemen, is capability. It's not content, it's capability. So we argue quite strongly that what we need for a sovereign industrial capability is capability. All right, we've got to get ourselves out of, out of these arguments. There's no, we don't gain anything by me buying a thousand bolts from a distributor here in Australia. We gain a lot by me putting a lot of money into research and development and developing a intercept sonar system for an Australian submarine. Again, capability is where we're at for that. Now, I guess I'd say um, particularly in terms of our strategic environment that we're in today, when we can't guarantee a supply chain, I can't get a part from my car. 
I don't know what happens in terms of a conflict where we have a nation to our uh, north that has the ability today to cut off the supply chain uh, via sea and via air today. They could do that to us today if they chose to. So anything and everything that we can do in Australia is an important thing. However, it's the smarts that count. Right, so when we get ourselves into a conflict, and there's every chance that we'll be in a conflict, nobody wants a conflict, and we, we sit here in these hollowed, or hallowed grounds you know, and, and having a look out there, and you know, very sadly, as, as, as Michael pointed out, there's a couple of squares there for dirt um, to be put into for, for future conflicts. None of us want that. Thousands and thousands of Australian men and women have died for this country in conflict, so we don't want a conflict. But there may be an inevitability to that conflict. We need the ability in this country to modify the equipment that we have. We need the ability in this country to increase the capability of the equipment that we have. In warfare, things will change very quickly, very, very quickly. Missiles will be fired. People will develop counter tactics to those missiles. <coughs> equipment will be able to detect missiles being fired, etc., etc. Countries will come up with ways to try and make those missiles more stealthy. And I know I'm belittling it very quickly for this speech, but the reality is you have a capability, then you have a counter capability, then you have a counter counter capability, and it goes on and on and on. Okay? If we don't have that ability in this country to determine or fix the counter counter capability, or do modifications to our equipment that may be required, that may not be a modification that the United States needs. You know, our submarines, having served in two classes of them, our submarines do things different to the Americans. Funnily enough, we operate a different submarine and we operate in a different, in different environment and we operate our submarines to do different things. And we have for <clears throat> many, many years carried different equipment sets on board our submarines. Some from America, a lot from ourselves. And a lot of that we've shared with the Americans as well. If we don't have the ability in country to do that, if we, if we allow ourselves to just go for the low-hanging fruit, then you'll get the industry that you want. We get ourselves focused on welders um, in this country a lot. Every politician desires a photo opportunity of a shipyard standing next to somebody in high vis with a helmet on and some glasses, or standing there with a stainless steel shovel as they're about to build a shipyard. Um, Welders are really important. So are engineers. So are scientists. So are people that can actually come out and develop new cutting edge technology. Because we need that for our men and women that are going to go to sea, who are going to fly, who are going to be in infantry divisions. We need to be able to give them the best that we can give them. I always use a couple of examples, and, and, and there, may be, there may be some objections, but one of the examples I always use is the, uh, the aircraft carrier during the Falklands War. So we were going to replace HMAS Melbourne. Um, the Falkland War came along. <clears throat> the British government made a decision that it required to retain the use of the Ark Royal. That's what they did. They're allowed to. It was their ship. We lost our aircraft carrier capability because of the British government's decision. Not because of the Australian government's decision. <clears throat> we lost the ability to get that aircraft carrier. We lost HMAS Melbourne. She was decommissioned. We didn't have a replacement. The gap became too long. We lost our fleet air arm and then we sold our A4s off to the New Zealand Air Force and the rest became history, right? So we lost an aircraft carrier <clears throat> because of the British government. Now I'm not having to go to the British government. They were involved in a war with Argentina, so I, I, I get it. But do we really want to hand our sovereign control to foreign governments? Now, the British government and the American government, I think all of us in this room, and probably hopefully everybody in Australia, would think they're probably our best and closest friends and the people that we can trust the most. Yet they will make a decision like that. If you look at over on class submarines during the Falkland War, Right? Now, that is one that affected me directly, um, <clears throat> and I am getting that old. But um, the British government put a moratorium on issuing all, all stores and supplies for Oberon-class submarines internationally. 
which meant that Australian submarines, Canadian submarines, Brazilian submarines, they all, we all had um, Oberons, were unable to proceed to sea for a period of time because we didn't have access to the store support because the British government kept all stores for their Oberon class submarines. So I know this is all over, you know, as we sort of descend into what is a sovereign industrial capability, these kind of examples are very important examples to take into account. We're not having a go at a prime contractor. We're not having a go at the British government or the American government. What we are saying is that we as a group of people, we as a nation, needs to be able to determine how we are going to do things. If we wish to do something different to the Americans, we should be able to do something different to the Americans. If we wish to modify a piece of equipment or develop a piece of equipment or modify a piece of equipment or put a new piece of equipment on board our platforms, we should be able to do that. We should have the ability in this country to do that. We should not have to give a series of engineering change requests to a foreign government, albeit we may get an emphasis um, or prioritise to do that. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> something that Australia might need may not be a high enough priority for what the Americans might need, and therefore we have to wait. And that, I think, firstly, is an unacceptable strategic position, but secondly, it could directly put the men and women of our um, services into harm's way. It could do that because we can't modify a piece of equipment with a known deficiency against a certain piece of a, a certain weapon. So that's why you have a sovereign industrial capability. Now I think, Mike, I think I've probably got to about where I need to be. I, th I think you might have been looking at your watch. So I, that's my cue. Um, happy to take any questions. <coughs> has announced a new uh, review of force structure and uh, capability to uh, be completed by March of next year. Um, how will Aiden contribute to that and what will be some of the main points? Um, thanks, thanks, Chris. Thanks very much for the question. Um, obviously, um, yeah, we're, not, we're not here to tell the government how to do its business um, in terms of its force structure review. What we are here to do is to ensure that the government takes into account the inclusion of Australian industry in any of, that, in any of those discussions. We need to be very, very careful in this country right now, very careful. You've had the cancellation of the attack class program. Um, now, I've been on the public record there. There were some 700, 800 Australian companies involved in that, and they had spent combined uh, nearly $200 million on that program. None of them have been compensated and yet the Australian government struck a deal with the French government very recently and paid them $830 million compensation for that deal. Now, I'm not going to question that. The only thing I'm going to say is that $530 million of those dollars went to the French government as the 63% shareholder of Naval Group, OK? And we haven't got any compensation for Australian companies. Now, our argument is um, I don't think Australian companies want money, and I've spoken to a lot of them, I think what Australian companies want is, if you remember my slide with the ship, they would like to see a whole bunch of those flags changed from whatever to, uh, to Australian flags. So to answer your question maybe more, more, more succinctly, uh, Chris, we've approached the government and government's asked Aidan to, to contribute to all those studies. Uh, we'll be contributing from an industrial perspective, so we'll be working with the government to help them understand the cap relative capabilities, strengths and weaknesses of Australian companies. We'll be working with government to help them identify shortfalls in certain areas. Uh, we'll also be working with government to ensuring that they um, uh, upskill uh, where they need to upskill. We'll also work with government and advise them where we think that there's no point in trying to create an artificial Australian environment, okay? And, and, and this is really important to remember. And I'm gonna go back to, to the, the attack class submarine. Um, there, there were a couple of components of that submarine. Uh, the, the bulkheads, I won't bore you with details, and we can talk about submarines forever if you want. But um, 
in, in that submarine, there were a few elements of that submarine that were cold forged steel. What's that? That's just steel that basically is cold pressed. And it's an artisan skill, and, and the French shape the steel with moulds and, and, and cutouts and, and, and forge that steel, and it goes at either in the submarine or a couple other places. It's really spectacular, it looks really good. Very specific equipment. There are 12 people in the world that could do that, and they're all in France. Australia wanted to transfer that capability to Australia. The Department of Defence wanted that capability in Australia. Now, that capability would have been hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of equipment and training. There are 12 people in the world that can do it. Right? And once you've done it, so once you've done it 12 times, you never do it again unless you build that submarine, like a 13th submarine. So the argument there is that's, there's no cost advantage to doing that, right? But if we want to create an electronic warfare capability in this country, and we've got 20 companies that have a bit of capability, but if we bring them together or we do some investment or we do some technology transfer, we can grow their capability and their ability to do things, then that's money well spent. So, Chris, they're the sorts of things we'll be doing. We're not going to... I'm not going to sit there and say to Richard Miles, hey, you know what, Minister, get rid of those tanks. I reckon you need this. That's, that's not Aidan's job. We, we're going to talk about industry. Sorry. John Hitchin, if we build... When we build the submarines in Australia, the thing... I'm not, not regardless of where it comes from, can we some decide to add extra equipment which was not in the original country specification? Oh, look at me, it's a really good question. Um, so my, my I guess, um, putting my program manager's hat on for a minute, um, you want to have as least amount of changes as you possibly can to whatever you're getting, right? Um, which is why I would naturally personally lean towards, there, there are many reasons why this may not happen, but I would personally lean towards the Virginia class model because Australia operates a US combat system and uses US weapons, right? So the modifications to that submarine in terms of the weapon storage compartment, in terms of the combat management system, in terms of the sensors, blah, 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 right? That's a lot of work, right? And we'll create a lot of design risk if we were to say we want to take this bit and put it into this submarine. Okay, they're a very complex submarine. So you know, most submarines compose about a million components, roughly. Um, if I put that in perspective, a space shuttle has about seven hundred fifty thousand components. So submarines are really complex, and every time you start to change something, um, it's not I'm just changing this. I'm changing everything that's connected to this. So we would. We would certainly advocate to government to not change things, um, and particularly if we're going to try and, and build these things in Australia, and you know my position, I believe we can, right? But the more changes we do from the base design that we pick, the more risk we induce, the greater the probability that we'll have cost blowout, and the greater the probability that we'll have schedule slippage. It's just a reality. So, yeah. Stephen Courtney, Royal Australian Navy. Um, so, you were also discussing the regional area. So, that my question is, whilst Australia is a big country, we need to cooperate with New Zealand, America to build things. America has taken Austral and are building their LSCs and their fast frigates and all their new ships. They've just contracted for some um, ocean going tugs from Austral. But New Zealand operates Anzac frigates and they contracted a Canadian company to refit them because they didn't want to come to Australia. And I still remember the Australian Defence Minister or Minister in, at the time standing up in the Senate and saying he wouldn't get the Australian Submarine Corporation to build a canoe because he didn't have trust in them. Now, I trust the Navy, I trust the people that built my ship. A little bit. <laughs> I'll, I'll admit I'm not a Spanish build ship. <laughs> but we need that capability again. We've lost the government aircraft factory. We've lost all these things that generations ago we had. Is that something you guys can filter through from the ground up, or do we need the government to kind of legislate to create new industries? It's a great question. Um, 
Which, which Spanish built ship? Start of Iceland. <laughs> Alright, so I was a BS. This is, um, that we were It's a good ship. Um, but all jokes aside, uh, so, so our perspective is that you need to recreate the industry that you've lost. So we've lost a lot of industry. It's not just defence industry, it's manufacturing industry across the board, right? Now, I'm not going to get into a debate with anybody about the car industry and whether it should have been retained or lost. I mean, it's gone, right? Um, and and there, are, there are arguments that it was being subsidised at billion dollars a year by the Australian taxpayer, blah, 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 right? OK, sure. But you also lost an automotive industry. Um, and if you think about automotive industries, if you look at the US, you know, the US automotive industry supports its mechanised uh, infantry divisions um, in terms of componentry. So we, we need to be a bit smarter about some of this stuff, like letting Ford and Holden go. <clears throat> Maybe that saved a billion dollars, but what did we lose? We lost an entire supply chain that could that actually was supplying componentry to, to Bushmasters, to Hawkeyes, doing maintenance work on Abrams tanks, etc. We lost all that, right? and all that skill set's gone, um, and, you, and you won't get it back right, from, the, from the automotive perspective. So, our argument to defence, or I should say to government, because it's not an argument to defence. Our argument to government is pretty simple. They need to work out what they want as a sovereign industrial capability. They need to tell everybody what that sovereign industrial capability is. If I walk into Russell today <clears throat> and I go speak to all the Bantus and two stars that, that reside in Russell and I go, what's a sovereign industrial capability? I'll get an answer. What's a sovereign industrial capability? I'll get a different answer. And I do that around the room, right? So no one knows in Russell, what it is. And it's not their fault. No one's told them. Right? So they're all, they're, all, they're all smart people. They're all going, I think it's this. Okay? I have a view of what a sovereign industrial capability is. Am I right? No. God knows. I don't know if I'm right. It's not my job to be right. It's the government's job and responsibility to say what it is they want. So if they want to have a shipbuilding, a national shipbuilding capability in this country, so we're not buying a whole bunch of stuff out of parole in the future, right? they need to articulate that, they need to legislate that, and they need to have the policy that works to do that. That's, that's their job. Right? You can't be the minister, <clears throat> well, I guess you can be the minister, but you can't be the minister and say to Angus Campbell, Angus, go forth and create a sovereign industrial capability and come back to me when it's done. Right? Angus Campbell is a very intelligent man, um, you know, four star general. Never created a sovereign industrial capability in his life. Right? Do I want him to command my troops in the battlefield? Yeah, probably. He's probably pretty good at that. Right? <clears throat> Do I want him to sit down and come up with a plan to create a sovereign industrial capability? Yeah, I'm not convinced about that one. Okay? Um, and it's an unfair expectation from government to place that burden on defence. And then you get the flow down, right? So, you know, Russell is what Russell is, and when I left submarines and went to Russell, didn't stay long, I left. Um, but Russell is what it is, okay? Um, <clears throat> there are lots of decisions that get made there by well-intentioned decisions with a bunch of people trying to interpret what they need to do. And that flows us all the way down. So you and, you and the fleet end up at the, at the, at the end of that decision-making process. Um, but to answer the question, government needs to determine what it wants to do. We, we could do it. Sweden does everything, right? Sweden is half the population of Australia and has half the GDP of Australia. And they build fighters and they build submarines, and they build combat vehicles, and they do everything. So I'm not going to sit here and accept somebody saying to me that we couldn't do it, right? But let's accept that the cost to do that is so horrendous that we need to work out which bits we want to do that are really important. And that's the job of government. Is that...? Yep. Well finish there, but if you'd like to speak to Brent after we finish here, that would be great.
I'll now call on Captain Chris Skinner to provide a vote of thanks. Uh, Brett, you've given us lots of food for thought and uh, a lot of very pertinent issues that I think we see in the media a lot uh, but don't quite link them up with each other. Um, specifically though, um, I, I took careful note of your very rich experience from both sides of uh, the supplier and uh, customer relationship uh, and with a number of different countries and I think that gives you enormous um, credibility and uh, the potential to provide real leadership to government uh, and you've already been talking to the new ministers and that's very encouraging to hear you say that and uh, I'm sure we all wish you every success with more of that, particularly leading, as I said in my question, to the uh, review that's all going to come to a head in March of next year. Um, just a, a few thoughts that I'd like to leave with you for that. Um, I sense that back in the old days, you know, back in the 70s and 80s when things like the Anzac frigates were being put together and so on, there was somewhat greater clarity and that might have been because of the Cold War and it might have been that China wasn't right on our doorstep. Might have, might have been the program director. <laughs> oh, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but um, what I think took place then was a, an expectation that sustainability of a military capability extends all the way through from the initial procurement right through the full life cycle of that capability and you need to therefore think about where do your spare parts come from, how do you get your uh, people trained um, and how do you avoid the almost inevitable cannibalisation that goes on even today in uh, military uh, uh, units as I'm sure most people in this room will have experienced. Um, and I just leave a thought with you that maybe we need to um, decouple the economic side of the house, that is the dollars and the number of jobs and so on, and the percentages of Australian industry capability on the one hand, and to concentrate much more on availability, you know, days ships available to uh, sail, aircraft are uh, not stuck on the ground, uh, combat uh, units are available to deploy and so on and look at it from what industrial input is needed to mm -hmm. make that happen. But anyway, um, it was lots of good food for thought. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Um, I'd like to make a small presentation on behalf, on behalf of Rusi. Um, firstly, a, uh, one of our ties, like my, the one I'm wearing. Which means? <laughs> <laughs> and most importantly, honorary membership Oh, uh, thank for the you very coming much. year, which uh, we'd be very honoured for you to uh, join us as oh, wow. uh, much as you're able to. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in showing our appreciation. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. I'd just like to uh, mention a few of our upcoming things. Uh, the board will be meeting here at. Uh, 1500 or 3 p.m. today. Um, don't forget on Friday the 26th of August here will be our 134th birthday afternoon tea and uh, some details on that will be out to you shortly. And then on the 30th of August uh, we have one of our previous speakers Brigadier Langford back to talk to us about harnessing artificial intelligence and big data. And then in September we go into the cyber security aspects of AUKUS uh, with Professor Barahad Harajan <coughs> who's a cyber security expert from the University of Newcastle. So that brings our lecture today to a close. Thank you very much for your attendance and your attention.